going to study God's Word. Open your Bible today. Genesis chapter 3 is where we are. The saddest chapter of the Bible. We're going to take another step as we study through the great and challenging book of Genesis. I have loved this study. It's amazing to me every time I study through a book, that book becomes my favorite. Well, this one's my favorite now. As we study through this great and challenging Word of God, as we think about the first chapters of Genesis, we know that God Almighty brought forth an amazing and awesome creation. He brought forth the heavens. He brought forth the earth. He brought forth all the vegetation and all the creatures of the earth. God looked over this vast expanse of nothingness, nothing beyond himself. And because of love and because of a desire for connection and relationship, he created the universe. And as the pinnacle of the universe, he created men and women. And we know that his creation came simply because he spoke the words. That's called creation ex nihilo, meaning that from absolute nothingness comes creation. God spoke the word and creation came to be. Amen? Young people, it is not about a big bang. It is about the spoken word of God bringing matter and creation and human beings into place placing them in his universe, having a special relationship with us. In six perfect days, he created all things, crowning his creation with a man and woman created in his very image. All was perfect. All was in harmony. All was in unity. Animals had no fear. Human beings were perfectly taken care of. And let's remember in that God's creative process, he also created an angelic multitude. Now, the Bible is not specific about when God created the angels, but in his act of creation, God created the angelic army, the angelic multitude of heaven. Write this reference down, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. That verse in Colossians says this, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. So the angelic multitude is indeed a creation of God's very hand. The an angelic army was created at one time. Multitudes upon multitudes of angels brought into being by the very word of God. Matthew chapter 22 verse 30 says that angels do not marry. That then brings the implication they also do not reproduce but rather God brought them all to be in one moment of time, his timing, and they are messenger spirits of God. People do not become angels at any time. When you pass away from this earth, even though country music tells you so, you're not gonna get angel wings because you don't become an angel. Angels are angels, people are people, eternally so. So I don't know about wings, but I do know you won't be an angel. You will be a person. You will be the person God created you to be. You will look like you, I believe. I believe they're in, in perfection. I will recognize you in heaven. And I am so thankful to know that we are family now because we're going to be family forever through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. There are millions of people we're going to meet, but I'm going to know you. And I'm so glad for that. Let's make a covenant together. Whether you go first or I go first, let's meet each other at the gate, okay? Because I'll know you. But the angels were created all at one time. However, sometime after that creative process, one leading angel, whose name was Lucifer, decides to attempt an overthrow of God's throne. He was going to take God's place. He was going to arise above God and take God's place of leadership and rulership of the universe. Now, according to Ezekiel chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 14, God Almighty cast him out of heaven cast that rebellion out of heaven. That was not going to be, and we know that Satan is going to inhabit the lowest pit of hell for all eternity one of these days. His name becomes Satan, which means the adversary, the adversary, the opponent of God, but also the adversary and the opponent of God's people, God's children, everyone. He hates God. He hates people. Satan has worked out of that hatred to drag people away from God. If you want to hurt God, hurt his children. If you want to hurt me, hurt my children. On a perfect level, if you want to hurt God, drag his children away from him. And that's exactly Satan's plan, is to drag God's children to hell with him. And he begins with God's first 
two children, Adam and Eve. Of course, as Satan attempts to drag people to hell, that is his ultimate act of defiance against God. But he is still at that act today. Now, with God's first two children, Satan deceives the woman, tricks her into believing that God was unfair to deny her the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan said, Eve, Eve, God only told you not to eat of this fruit because he knew if you eat of this fruit, you will become like him. Right now he is your God, but you eat of this fruit of this tree and you will become your own goddess. You will be on equal standing with your creator God. She does disobediently eat that fruit. She steps into rebellion when she eats that fruit. Adam follows the same course of rebellion in that he too eats the fruit. Instead of standing up and protecting and leading his wife as the head of the family, he falls to eating the fruit himself. I want you to realize this though. With Adam and Eve eating that fruit, it was an individual decision for each one of them. They personally decided to eat of that fruit of disobedience and rebellion against God. It was a personal decision. Just as sin is a personal decision for every one of us. So both of them eat, and immediately, as they fall into disobedience and into sin, they also fall into guilt and into sorrow and ultimately into death. God in his justice must deal with Satan. He must deal with Adam, and he must deal with Eve. In his sinless perfection, he has to punish Satan's deception And he has to punish Adam and Eve for disobedience. Now, we studied Satan's punishment last week. And if you remember, the certain, the serpent which Satan inhabited for this act of defiance was cursed to crawl on its belly for the rest of earthly history. So the serpent, the snake as we know it now, must have had legs and some way perhaps stood up upright. And God cursed the serpent above all other animals. Now notice, though, in that wording, God says, I curse you above all the other animals. But in that curse, all the animals entered into the curse. The serpent above them all, but all of them were part of the punishment of God. And then we see that the serpent is cursed and Satan is also cursed as well. I want you to look at a verse. We covered it last week, but this is such an important verse. If you were not here, I do not want you to miss it. It is Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Look at that verse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This verse is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel. This is the first time you see in God's word that there will be a Savior. Look at these these words, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God says to Satan, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In that verse, we see a Savior. In that verse, we see a Redeemer. If you'll notice, he is referred to as her Seed That tells us that that Savior will be born of a virgin. There is no man in a biological way involved in that birth. The Holy Spirit of God is the father of that child. But he would be brought to this earth by way of a virgin. God also says, Satan, you're going to bruise his heel. We know that is happening one day to come when Satan would take Jesus to the cross and he would die there. However, God also says, but through resurrection, he is going to rise up and he's going to crush your head. You will bruise his heel, he will bruise your head. In other words, Satan, you're going to lose this battle because there will be a Savior coming by virgin birth to this earth, the perfect Lamb of God, and he will crush your head. Now, God turns to the man and woman. He has dealt with the serpent. He has dealt with Satan. He is now going to deal with Adam and Eve. He begins with Eve. Look at verse 16. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Unto the woman he, meaning God, said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he 
shall rule over thee. God tells Eve that having children now will be a painful, sorrowful process. It will be hard. And painful birth would remind her that she birthed sin and pain into God's creation by her act of disobedience, eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. However, I do want you to notice this. God assures her something that gives her hope. What he tells her is she will live to have children. So in the midst of punishment, he gives her a word of hope. She will live to have children. That's his blessing. She will not immediately die. She will die in an earthly sense, but she will be a mother before she does. And also, I'm sure that Eve heard God's curse of Satan, and God said, a woman is going to bring the Savior to the world. So there is great hope in the midst of punishment for Eve. He says, you're going to live to have children, and on down the line, a Savior is going to come through you, through a woman. A Savior will be brought to the world Now, I want you to also take note that God tells Eve, your desire is going to be for your husband, and he shall rule over thee. What does that mean? Well, basically what that says, God is telling her, your relationship with Adam, because of sin, will now not be perfect. As I created you as a husband and wife, and as I placed you in the garden under the creation of marriage, and again, I remind you, marriage was not the creation of a man and a woman. Marriage is the creation of God. Marriage is the covenant of God. And as God placed Adam and Eve in that garden in that perfect state, they were going to perfectly get along. It would not be so now because both of them are sinners. So God tells them that their relationship is not going to be perfect. He says, both of you are going to want your own will, and both of you are going to want your own way in the marriage relationship. Now, although marriage is God's creation, and it will remain God's plan, God says to Eve, it's not always going to be easy. Sometimes, maybe often, you're going to have sparks in your relationship because two sinners are going to clash together in the right way to go. You will want your way over Adam, Eve. You're going to want your way instead of his, and he's going to struggle to be the head of the family. Now, marriage is still the creation and the will of God, but let me ask you this. Is it still hard? Do I hear an amen? Amen. Gwen, you didn't have to speak so loud. (laughs) No, marriage is work. Marriage is is wonderful. Marriage is what God intends for most people, not all, but most people, marriage is intended for us. However, because of this sentence that God gives to Eve, he says it's not always going to be easy. There are going to be sparks of conflict because two sinners are married together, and there's going to be struggle there, but it is my will, says God, that marriage continue to exist. Now, God turns his gaze to Adam. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Genesis 3, go to verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God tells Adam, you will die. Adam, although you briefly found carefree days and ease in taking care of the garden in which I placed you. Now sin and your disobedience and your rebellion against me is going to make life much, much harder. Roses and plants are now going to have thorns. Isn't it interesting that God Almighty created thorns in this moment? And God knew very, very well that some years later those very thorns would be 
knit into a crown for his son. So God created thorns knowing that one day their purpose would be a crown for his son Jesus. The ground will not readily yield produce to you, Adam. You will have to hoe it. You will have to pull weeds. You will work in sweaty labor in order to bring home goods that you might feed your family. So not only did sin change Adam and Eve's life, sin changed the very structure of the earth. Sin changed the very way soil could produce its fruit. So God says, Adam, everything is going to be harder every evening when you come home from work. You're going to be tired. And you're going to think back about the blissful days in the Garden of Eden before you fell into sin. But now, because of sin, because of your disobedience, life is going to be much harder. And in verse 19, God gives the worst news of all. True to his promise, remember earlier in perfection, God commanded saying, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. That was a promise of God, and God now has to make good. Regretfully, he has to make good on that promise. In time, Adam, you will surely die. You were taken from dust. You will return to dust. Your body is not perfect. Your body now is going to age. As the years go by, your body is going to get weaker, and one day you will be buried. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Did you realize that up to this point in the creation story, Eve does not have a name? She is referred to as the woman. She is referred to as the wife of Adam. But in this verse, chapter 3, verse 20, is where Eve receives a name. Although Adam and his wife have been punished, Adam gives his wife a name of hope. Eve means living. Even though God had said, I have to fulfill my promise that one day surely you will die, Adam names his wife Eve, which means living. Before she dies, life will go on because she will have children. And also before the ancestry of Eve passes away, one special woman will bear to the world the Son of God. So Adam gives his wife's name, Eve, meaning living, to say, you will have children, and through you a Savior will come to the world, which will ultimately bring life and restore life to our world once again. Now, let's look at verses 21 through 24. Unto Adam also and to his wife... Did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3.21. If you remember, Adam and Eve had made makeshift, skin, uh, makeshift clothing for themselves with fig leaves, sewing them together because after sin they became ashamed of their nakedness. However, God realizes how poor that clothing was, and so God sews together animal skins to make acceptable garments to Adam and Eve. So that means, now think with me here, that means that the innocent blood of at least one animal was shed so that they could be clothed with those skins. And that points to a future truth, that the innocent blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be shed so you and I could be clothed in forgiveness. So you and I could wear robes of righteousness. In fact, write this reference down, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. 
And that verse says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. God clothed Adam and Eve with skins of animals. God clothes you and me by covering us with the blood of Christ, clothing us in salvation, clothing us in forgiveness, clothing us in his righteousness alone. That's amazing when we think about what that symbolizes in a future day. After God provides protective clothing to Adam and Eve, he then has to banish them from the garden. He has to banish them from this tree of life. That tree stood in the garden as the symbol that Adam and Eve would have eternal life. They had lost it. So that means that they had lost access to that special tree of life that stood in the garden. They no longer had access to the tree because they were sinners and they were bound now to die. So God has to remove them from the garden, but particularly from that tree. They could not have access to it anymore, the tree of life. The promise was now gone of their eternally living broken by disobedience, broken by sin. So God has to remove them from the tree. He sends them out of the perfect garden into a world that was not going to be easy. I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, it says that God drove them out of the garden. It was not an easy process for them or for God. He drove them out of the garden. They didn't want to go. This was a painful, sorrowful task for God Almighty. He literally had to push them out of this perfect place of existence because of their sin. He had to take them out of the Garden of Eden because they were going to be buried one day in a grave. And I believe that Adam and Eve wept bitterly when God had to drive them out of that perfect garden. And I believe that God also wept when he did what he had to do because of his perfect, righteous, holy nature, God Almighty did what he had to do to punish sin. The law of sin and death would now be in operation until the end of human history. And God placed holy angels at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. God placed a flaming sword there to block the way to that tree of life Chapter 3 of Genesis is the saddest chapter of the Bible because we see God's curse. We don't criticize God for it. He promised it, and God is always a God who keeps his promises, every one of them. He promised Adam and Eve what what he would do if they sinned, and they had to keep his promise. So after chapter 3, what we have is the necessity for the rest of the Bible to be written. Man and woman had fallen into sin and into disobedience. And so the rest of the Bible, which is the chronicle of how God brings salvation and forgiveness and restores heaven and eternity, the rest of the Bible had to be written so that we could see God's plan as it unfolds as to how we can be saved. The beginning of the Bible leads us to the truth that sin destroys us. The beginning of the Bible shows us that sin makes life hard. The beginning of the Bible shows us that sin separates people and that sin brings death. But thank God for the rest of the Bible because it is God's plan as to how life is restored to you and to me. Genesis 3, we see the tree of life barred from Adam and Eve. But we're going to close chapter 3 right now, and I want you to go to the end of the Bible to Revelation chapter 22. We see the beginning of the story. Let's go to the end of the story. God is relating here in Revelation to the old apostle John. And the Lord pulls back the curtain to give John a glimpse into heaven. And the old apostle sees God's new creation. Jesus Christ has overcome sin and death. Heaven is filled with God's great glory. God's city is so beautiful as a sparkling gem, a street of pure gold. By the way, notice it's not streets. 
one street. That one street leads to the throne of God. There's one way, one street of gold. All the people over the course of human history who received Jesus Christ, received their God in faith, are living there. And sin is forever gone. This is the concluding chapter of the Bible giving us the good news that eternity has been restored. Now look at Genesis, uh, rather, rather Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Old John writes this saying, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Genesis chapter 3, we see the tree barred. Revelation 22, we see the tree restored in heaven. In fact, there are two of them, one on either side of the street. In the middle of God's new and perfect city stands that same tree of life that was barred to Adam and Eve. Now it stands in heaven. It is open to all. I fully believe with the, that to the bottom of my heart that one day you and I will eat the fruit of that tree as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be our eternal home, and we will have access to that tree of life because we have received him as our Savior. Now, Genesis chapter 3 is one sad chapter, but the rest of the Bible shows us God's plan and this wonderful ending that we will all live in glory with access to that tree. Living in glory and forgiveness through Jesus, living in glory and restoration and blessing and joy and eternal life. Thank God, Christian, for his plan. Thank God that his plan encompasses you and me. Thank God you and I had the opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, and our names have been written in the book of life. That also is in the book of Genesis, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. It tells us about the book of life, and when you say yes to Jesus as Savior, God Almighty, thankfully, it's not by a computer, it's by his very hand, inscribes our name in the book of life to be there for all eternity. One day, I will see my name in God's book of life written by the very penmanship of God, and so will you. You will have access to the fruit of the tree of life, and we will live together in, in that glorious city of God for all eternity because he gives it to us only through the grace of Jesus, his son. Not because of who we are, what we've done, but because we said yes to his son Jesus who clothed us then in righteousness and salvation. What a, what a great message, what great news that is. And it should be an excitement to our life that surrounds us every day we live, that guides our steps every step we take. We should live in that joy. We should be grateful for the God who gives us life, that life that we're going to have. And we participate in it right now. The moment you say yes to Jesus is the moment you receive eternal life. What good news that is. And we should live in thanksgiving. We should live in praise. We should live in worship. And we should also live in service. Pastor Jeffrey this morning was talking to our young people, our teenagers, about what it means to love the Lord. And you love the Lord, and you express that love by serving him. Every one of us has some purpose in the kingdom. We have some work in the kingdom's work. We have some ministry that we are to do. Every one of us. Because our Lord God loves us and saves us and gives us the purpose and the joy of serving him. Find your purpose, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't know it, find your purpose. Pray for your purpose. Let us help you find that purpose and that joy of serving him. But today, if you're in this sanctuary or you're going to listen to this sermon in some other way on an iPod or by Internet and you've never come to Jesus as your Savior, please hear this. Brothers and sisters, don't rustle, don't move, just pray. Please hear this message. Jesus Christ gave his life on that cruel, agonizing cross. He poured his blood out unto death. So today you could have the clothing of righteousness. He gave himself to the cross freely. He didn't have to do it. No one forced him there. He freely gave himself to the cross. 
for this moment in your life right now that you might say yes to him as your Lord and your Savior so you could be clothed in forgiveness. He died to save you. He died to give you eternal life. He died to fulfill that promise that you will live with him in glory. God's throne is there. That book of life is there. And in it, God has written every name of every person who has ever come to him in faith. Today, if your name is not in that book, no matter who you are, what color you are, how rich or poor you are, of what nation you come from, it does not matter. If your name is not in the book, Jesus died to clothe you in righteousness. And if you will simply come and say, I believe Jesus Christ gave his life that I might be forgiven and saved, and he is a resurrected Lord that I might have eternal life, I believe it. I believe that message is for me. I'm coming to surrender my life to Jesus today in the very penmanship of God. The moment you say yes, he writes your name in the book. Don't let him close the book today without your name being in it. You come. He's waiting for you. Brothers and sisters, we have so much ministry to do. There are so many lost people out there. We cannot be lazy in this work. I pray that you and I will commit ourselves to serving him and loving him. Church home, whatever you need, our mighty God meets us here. Let's pray. Our Father, our God, thank you for these moments. Lord, once again, I must say thank you for this congregation that allows me a few extra minutes on Sunday mornings past noon. But Lord, as we bring this service to a conclusion, we conclude with a very, very important part of it, and that's a decision time. I pray, Father, that the people of God will be respectful of that one who needs to make a decision, giving them the time to do that. Most importantly, if there's one person who needs to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ, today is that day the pen of God is poised at the book to write that name down. He or she just needs to come and say yes to Jesus Christ, confessing with their lips that Jesus is Lord and believing in their heart that God raised him from the dead. They will be saved, according to Romans 10, 9. Help us to give the time for that one to make that decision. Brothers and sisters in Christ, help us make the decision to further surrender our life to you, every part of it. Church home, whatever the need, need for healing, give us that time. Bless us in these moments in Jesus' precious name. Amen.